It doesn't have to be a big ordeal. And um, it's just cool. And I am looking forward to more of the supernatural happening all the time, wherever we go, at the gas station, like he said, wherever. Just be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. You're natural. He uses you. I love what one pastor I listen to says. He is in you for you. He is on, comes on you for other people. Because He's inside of you now. You're, you're, you're saved. He's in you for you. But sometimes you'll, you'll, He'll come on you. You go, oh, here's the Holy Spirit. His presence is here. Sometimes that's for you. Most of the time go, why is He here? And look around. Pay attention. Say, why are you here? Because many times He's here and He comes on you for you, for other people. I'm sorry. And so it's just an exciting way to live, to live moment by moment. And so we're going to jump into James 1, 1 through 5, if you'll put that up there. We've been talking about this last couple of weeks. It's a long verse, but we're going to... This, this today is going to be a soldier training. And you may not like that, but he calls us a soldier. He calls you a farmer. That would be another message. Calls you the bride of Christ. That's another message. He calls you living stones. That's another message. You get all these analogies. Why does he call you names? Because those are functions that he uses in your life and that you operate in. But today we're, we're going to sort of focus on the soldier part, even though he doesn't have it in here. And it says, From James, a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, to God's faithful people who have been scattered. So this is to Christians. Greetings. And that's important. When you are tested, we're going to go into this more, turn to God. So you're going to be tested. Let me just jump here, and we'll come back to these verses here in a minute. There, there are some streams of Christianity. There's a balance here. There's some streams of Christianity that uh, it's almost like hell. Have you ever heard of hellfire and damnation preaching? If you're not saved, there is a hell. But once you're saved, guess what? You're going to heaven. But then they'll just sort of slightly twist the hellfire and damnation preaching that he's out to get you. You know, uh, uh, don't do this, don't do that. He's going to zap you. Now, there is consequences to sin. I'm not saying to sin. But he calls you a saint. We already talked about that. And, and But sometimes you think God's just out to get you. That's one extreme way over here. Another extreme, and there's streams of Christianity, that you never go through tests or trials if you're living in faith and doing what's right. Let me tell you, the hell, fire, and damnation's not right, and the never having testing and trials is not right. It's sort of in the middle. Okay? Because it says here, to God's faithful people who have been scattered greetings when you are tested. So if you're a Christian, so let's try to find the middle here. Um, Where do these trials come from? He left you in the world. See, when you got saved, He could have zapped you straight to heaven. No more tests, no more trials. We spent the last two weeks talking about the importance of you being eternal. You came from the eternal God, and you're going back to the eternal God. Okay, now you didn't know it before. But when you were born, that egg and that sperm came together and you got physical DNA. We also we looked at Psalms 139, 15. says He formed you in the womb. He knitted you. His spiritual DNA came in there and laid on top of that physical DNA or reverse even maybe. And so you, we know from Ephesians 2.10, He created you beforehand. I don't even know what that means. But somewhere even before that egg and sperm kicked together, at least in your mind, His mind, He created you. Maybe there was more. I don't know. It doesn't say. You were created beforehand and given good works to do. Well, what are those good works? It's not just helping old ladies or old men across the street. It's to change your world. See, He created Adam and Eve, as we've talked about the last two weeks. Some of you haven't been here, but it might help to review. It says in Genesis 1.27, He says, I created you in my image to have dominion. That doesn't mean dictatorship. That means to steward, create, grow, mature my principles into the earth. I created you to have dominion over the plants, teach you how to be a farmer if you want to be a farmer, teach you how to uh, over the... the, the uh, the uh, animals, that's not to hunt, but to steward them, to use them for, for good. 
and to, to, he created that and he wanted Adam and Eve and his descendants to spread that pattern of the Garden of Eden. It was like a puzzle, it was like a pattern over the whole earth because most of the earth was bare and, and barren. I mean, it was, or wild maybe. And he says, take this pattern and spread it all over the earth. And we said, no, we know better. We'll do how we want to do. But you know, that mandate never disappeared. And when you got saved, he says, guess what? You could still have dominion. You can, with my help, you can still have a good marriage. With my help, I can help you live more than just from paycheck to paycheck and on the edge of eviction. And with my help, I can help you be a good parent and raise kids in the same pattern. But the difference was in the Garden of Eden, he gave it to them and they couldn't hold it. So what he's doing now, when you get saved automatically, you know, your spouse is not the most loving spouse just overnight. Your kids don't all of a sudden behave. You're not all of a sudden, you know, financially got all the bills paid. He's saying, I gave it to man. They couldn't hold it. So what we're going to do now is I've given you the ability to start where you're at and change your world around you as you lean into me. See, the reason they got kicked out of the Garden of Eden is they didn't lean into him. You know what I mean by lean into him? Listen. Turn to the person on your left and say, you just got to listen. It's that simple. You just got to listen. Curry Blake is a funny story, but there is some good principle. Curry Blake is a guy that uh, has been leading this national conference. I mean, this conference, the national speaker up at Northwest Christian Fellowship. I had, the, I had the honor of sitting by him and eating dinner with him. With some other, It wasn't just me, but I was sitting by him on Friday, so we, we talked. And he said he was mentored by Lester Summerall. If any of you have been in the charismatic Pentecostal stream, tremendous just man of God. He's passed on and going on. And an apostle of apostles, just unbelievable. Uh, Lester Summerall was in Dallas. He's, I'm going to make the story short. He saw Curry Blake. He didn't know Curry Blake. He, says, you, he said, when are you going to visit me in South Bend, Indiana? That's where he was. That's all he said. He said, as soon as I can get a bus up there. He just had one car, had to leave it with his wife and three kids. So he takes a bus from Dallas to South Bend. I don't know how long that would take. It would take a long time in a car and a bus. It had to take a very long time. Stopping at all these places going up there. This was many, probably a couple decades or more ago. He finally meets, goes up there, and, is, and on the bus he says, I just want Lester Summerall to answer two, two questions, plus whatever reason he has me come up here. First, how do I know the will of God? Second, how do I uh, get led by Holy Spirit? So he goes in. He walks into his office. He's just writing. He didn't speak to him for a few minutes. He looks his head up, and he said, this is how you know the will of God. He didn't know what Curry said. This is how you know the will of God. Read your Bible. This is how you're led by the Holy Spirit. Do the Bible. And that was the end of it. And he went back to Dallas, Texas. We went all that way for that word. And, I, uh, and I, I don't know what all that was about. It had to be a little disappointing, but he got his answer. And so it's just the same for us. Turn to somebody around you and go, you just need to read your Bible. Turn to the other person and just say, you just need to do the Bible. I'm convinced. And so, but as you read the Bible and as you do the Bible, he'll start giving you insight on how to bring the, his principles, the big buzzword in all of Christianity now, whether you're denominational, evangelical, non-denominational, charismatic, is the kingdom of God is here. Have you all heard that phrase? I'm not sure everybody really knows what it means, but it's a true statement. Jesus said, I have come to bring the kingdom. So it actually started 2,000 years ago. Well, what is the kingdom? The kingdom is this, bringing the king's principles into your domain. Kingdom. And so as you walk closely with him, he's going to start saying, in this domain of your life, parenting, marriage, business, whatever it may be, Kids sports, you, this is, I want these principles from me to be put into that. And that's how we start expanding our Garden of Eden. As you listen closely to Him and obey Him, you start expanding the Kingdom of God and start getting your little Garden of Eden. You go, I ain't seeing a whole lot of Kingdom Garden of Eden in my life right now. Hang in there, you will. It may take a little while, but as you start applying His principles, that Kingdom will grow and you'll go look back and go, you know, there's not quite as many weeds in my family as there used to be. How many of you can say that? 
But this is the deal. Many, so that's a true statement. So many times, though, he has you go, you know that weed over here in your marriage, that weed in your family, that weed over there, that weed is keeping good fruit from coming in. Yeah, but that weed's always been there. My mom said it. My grandmother said it. Yep, and they didn't have any fruit either. But if you listen to the Holy Spirit and pluck that weed, then it gives opportunity for growth for other things. That's simple enough, isn't it? But that's where the tests and trials come in. How many of you in your family have plucked a weed? Now, this is all metaphor. Surely there's no weeds in your living room, literal weeds. But these are relationships, ways of doing finance, ways of acting, behaving, habits, routines. You change that, what happens almost every time? We've always done it that way. You're just too spiritual. You say, well, God told me to do that. Well, God didn't tell me to do it. Are you better than me? Can you hear better than me? Well, no, he just told me to do it. He didn't tell you. You do what you're supposed to do. But that's all of a sudden you get pushback, trials and tribulations. You get a good idea at work and you implement it. And then all of a sudden that boss that's been there for 48 years go, we've never done it that way. Well, can I do this? And you have to work through the trials and tribulations. And even sometimes, depending on how big that weed is, if it's been there, the a demonic Thoughts, demonic actions, soulish actions were behind that thing. You pluck that, it's like pulling up a, uh, pulling it up, and there's a hole in the ground that reaches to hell. How many of you have ever been there? What's the deal? Those are trials and temptations from the outside. There's external trials and temptations, and there's internal trials and temptations. And the um, Ephesians six twelve says, "For our struggle is not against." flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. And so those are trials and tribulations. I was just obeying God. And all of a sudden, life's gone to hell. Well, that's cool. Praise God. Hallelujah. What does this say? Let's go on right back down here. Turn to God. Verse 2. My brothers and sisters, be very happy when you're tested in different ways. We'll talk more about that. You know that such testing of your faith produces endurance. Endure until your testing is over. Then you will be mature and complete and you will not need anything. If any of you need wisdom to know what you should do, you should ask God and He will give it to you. So what happens is when you go into trials, go, Father, I need wisdom right now. This is the exact opposite of what I thought would happen. Has anybody been there or is it just me? Now, verse 2 says, My brothers and sisters, be very happy. I actually don't like this translation on that verse. I like it on other ones. The King James says, Count it all joy when you pluck that weed and hell comes in. Do y'all know what I'm talking about? I'm, you know, you just plot your own life. This isn't, I obeyed God and it got worse. Why did it get worse? Because you're going in the right direction. If it didn't get worse, you're probably doing what you're not supposed to be doing. Because the devil will leave you alone because his kingdom, he has his own kingdom. There are people knowingly or unknowingly, consciously or unconsciously, following principles that are not God and bring it into their domain, and he's happy with that. As long as you're not bringing God's principles, the king's principles into his domain. So when all hell comes loose, here's the, here's the key here. Verse 2, out of the King James, count it all joy. Oh, Craig, you have got to be kidding. <clears throat> now this is hard. It didn't say... And that's why I don't like this translation. It didn't say to be happy, because you may not be happy. There's a difference between happiness and joy. Happiness is based off your circumstances. Joy is a fruit of Holy Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Nine fruits of the Holy Spirit. One of them is joy. So, how do you get joy? You do this. So, when you open, when you pull that weed and it opens a door to hell, do you all know what I'm talking about? You go, Father, I'm not real happy right now. i just soon not pull this weed. But I thank you that you're getting the weeds out of my garden. And eventually, an orange tree, or an apple tree, or roses, or whatever is supposed to come up, is going to come up. 
And right now, Holy Spirit, I need joy, not because of the hell, but because you're showing me what's coming. And I count it God of what's coming. You've got to, uh, it says, walk by faith, not by sight. By sight is this. I just pulled that weed. And I didn't like the weed. It wasn't great. Things weren't exactly right. But it's worse now that I pulled the weed. What's worse now when I started living for God? Worse now when I told my friends, I'm just not doing this anymore. I love you. Oh, hang around, but I ain't doing that no more. It got worse. And so what you do is you literally go, Father, thank you, and give me a vision of where this thing's going to end up. I trust in you. See, trials is about who do you trust. When, the, when you pull that weed, the trials get crazy. And it wants to focus your eyes on the physical circumstances around you. And you have to. You can't ignore it. But you know, on top of the physical trials, that's a reality. We don't deny that hell's happening. But, you know, there's another reality that's a spiritual reality that as you pull those seeds, I mean, pull those weeds, He's going to replace it with, with good fruit. And so we walk by faith that He's working. And what that does is develop in us what it says here, endurance and maturity. Do I need to repeat that or are you all all right with that? So, Father, I thank you. You just have to do it out of your mouth. That this thing's going to end up well. My garden's going to produce good fruit. It may not look like it now, but it's going to happen. How many of you have done physical gardens or into flowers or things like that where you plant stuff. Okay, you've got to till that ground up and you put that seed in. Does, is, if you're doing a rose bush, is there immediately a rose bush? You by faith are saying that thing's going to come up out of the ground. And even when it comes out, it's just a little green shoot. Some things take a long time. But by faith, it was worth tilling the ground up. It's the same way with trials and tribulations. And the Lord allows us... See, He could just pull that weed up and plant a rose bush. But you probably wouldn't know how to hold your Garden of Eden. Oh, this thing needs water. This relationship needs care. This relationship needs garden prince. This business you've given me, if He just gave you a business, probably in six months it would be bankrupt. But if you build it brick by brick, step by step, learn how to manage cash flow, learn how to be a good employer and employees, learn all those skills, then as it's, then you'll know how to hold that business as you lean into Him. So what it produces here is two things. Verse 4, endure until your testing is over, then you will be mature and complete. That's another thing to be joyful over. Your, these tests and trials is to teach you how to take territory, hold territory, take relationships in a good way, hold relationships. But the only way you get there is through endurance, which produces maturity. Have you ever met anybody that was mature? Now, what you're going to find is you won't find somebody mature in all areas. So if you're mature, go introduce yourself to Josh afterwards. You're going to find people are mature in certain areas. It may be business. They can just start businesses, run it, do it. Let me tell you a little secret. Um, I used to be an avid reader of of business biographies. Got a whole shelf of them. Most of them I'm taking to McKay's bookstore now. Behind every successful entrepreneur, on average, is ten failed businesses. Why? They were developing the skills of getting rid of the weeds. And only those that endured ended up having successful businesses. So they're mature in business. You find people mature in, in parenting, mature in relationships, mature different areas. You get to know them, you realize they went through a lot of testing and trials to get to where they are and they know how to hold it. Let me give to you the word. 
Now, how do you become mature? We're breaking this verse down, but you can read it up there. You have to go through endurance in tests and not give up. Or if you give up, you repent and get back in the race. So if you find somebody that's mature, they've been through a lot of tests and they endured. They didn't have to do it perfectly, but they didn't give up. So every one of you in here want to be mature. I mean, that's just in us. I'm trying to find the, the passage. Can't quite find it, but that's all right. So every one of us want to be mature. So you know, what do you got to do? Break down, deconstruct my logic I just did. You got to go through tests. And you got to go through a lot of tests. And you got to endure it. And so you're going to do it one way or the other. Why? Because it says in Ephesians 4, 11 and 12, the Lord gives five gifts to the church, apostle, prophet, pastor, evangelist, and teacher, until they're mature. God, you are His Son. He's, he's committed to making you mature in whatever areas. Not all of you, all of you are business. It's be different areas. But he's committed to making you mature, so he's going to bring tests and trials along your way. And if you run from them, guess what? You failed the test. But guess what? You never fail a test permanently. He just brings it back around again. There are some tests I've taken multiple times, a lot of times. And I finally realized, this God has a one-track mind. Let's go to something else. This is crazy. Every time I go to him, he goes, I love you, man. And then this test comes along. I don't want to do this test no more. Well, it's you got a calling, Ephesians 2.10. you got good works to do. Well, I don't want to do those good works. You'll be happy when you pass the test. So just give in and say, Lord, I count it all joy. I can't wait to see what you bring out of this. I can't wait to see what happens. Now, let me give to you the definition of, of endurance. King James says patience. I like endurance better. That's one reason I picked this translation. No translation makes everything right. It's sort of you pick one or the other. I like I like the count it all joy in King James, but I like the endurance here. Because in the Strong's, if you look, I don't know Hebrew, but if you've got a Strong's concordance, you can look at it on Bible Gateway or the Blue Letter Bible on the, on the Internet or Bible Gateway on the Internet or get it on your app, uh, app on your phone. But this is the Strong's. gives you the Greek word. In the, it's the... The characteristic of a man, this includes women, who is not swerved from his deliberate purpose. Who is not swerved from his deliberate purpose. It's pretty good. Making you single-minded. You know, sometimes you just got to get stubborn in a good way. If you know you're doing what God wants you to do. And his loyalty to faith and piety by even the greatest trials and sufferings. I looked up in a, an American dictionary what endurance means. It's the ability to last. I'm telling you, he is doing this right now in the Christian church like I have never seen. American Christians are some of the wimpiest Christians on the planet. I mean, they're just wimpy. They have no endurance that can't endure a church service more than 38 minutes. If something says hard, they get up and leave. I'm telling you, he is cranking the pressure up. Not to be mean, but he wants to take territory. He wants the kingdom of Satan to be shrunk. And in his sovereignty, he has chosen you and I to shrink his territory. He could just come in and wipe it all out. And he's going to, in the end, finish it up. But he's like, I want to teach these dudes how to take territory, how to be fighters, how to be soldiers. As we got on this left side, this banner, orange fire banner, our, 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 our goal is to teach you to be tenacious, skillful, and passionate disciples. And to take territory. And it's fun to win. Right now, Christianity is sort of on its back foot. and It's being pushed back. But I'm telling you, in the shadows, he is raising up Christians that are tenacious, 
skillful, bold, and will not back down. And yes, tests and trials are coming, but just think about this. Five years from now, you go tell your kids, you know, we used to be this way in our family or this way in our job. And he goes, well, I don't see that anymore. Yeah, me and, my, me and your mom, we broke that generational spirit. Me and your mom changed things by hard work. We ticked off some people, but now you're better off. I'm better off, and our world is better off. You're going to be able to, at the end of your life, look back at grandkids. They're not all going to be perfect, right? Because they got their own free will. But, they, but you're going to see a change from what was, especially if you're a first century, first century, a first generation Christian. If you're a first century Christian, please talk to me afterwards. I want to know how you did that. <laughs> How you live 2,000 years without dying. I want to know the trick. And so when you're in testing and trials, do this verse 5. Ask for wisdom. Count it all joy. That doesn't mean you feel good. That doesn't mean you're happy. That doesn't mean everything goes well. You go, that's where the faith comes in and you go, life's cool. My God's going to fill in where I cannot fill in. And you can only measure changes of your garden usually by long periods, a year or more. Because sometimes when you're in the battle, it can go on a long time. But then eventually you're going to look back and you go, it's worth it. Father, I thank you that it's going to be worth it. How many of you, this is a good word for you today. We're just going to do it. We're going to keep doing it. We're going to keep our eyes on Jesus. He does most of it, but there is a part for us. It's to count it all joy. If you've got family members that aren't following God, Just keep praying. Why? Because you're in covenant with God and thereby extension is their covenant under you. Now, they got their own free will and I don't quite know how you put all of this together, but um, God does. Endure, verse 4, until your testing is over, then you will be mature and complete and you won't need anything. Father, I thank you. I'm getting to the place where all my needs are met. All my weeds are gone. You know what that, comp- and so what, what that means is you can't give up. Keep praying. Keep declaring over that prodigal son or prodigal daughter or prodigal husband. This isn't like a, a biblical doctrine, but I have been in the ministry for decades. I have never seen a case where a spouse prayed for another spouse that wasn't saved, that sometime before they died, they got saved. Sometimes it's fast, it's usually not. It's usually like a decade or longer. Sometimes it's at the end of their life. But don't give up, because you're the only hope they have. You keep praying for them and say, Father, I thank you that I've got a covenant with you, and it extends over to them. And you're not going to go against their free will, but you're going to control circumstances, do something, and just I declare over them that they are a passionate follower of Jesus Christ. If they're not saved, I pray they get radically saved. There's a lot of encounters of people getting radically saved. Paul was murdering Christians and hunting them. And on the road between Jerusalem and, um, what was it, Antioch or Tarsus, I don't remember, he was on the road, he gets radically saved. He can, he can show up to you, show up to your kid. Show up to your spouse in the middle of the night. You just keep praying. Don't give up. Count it all joy. Ask for wisdom. Father, am I praying the right way? Should I pray a different way? Um, wow. Let me close with this. Lastly, what, when you're in trials and tribulations, get people around you that can properly encourage you. Don't be like Job. He goes through a major, Job, the Old Testament book, he went through a major battle. All his friends said, you deserve it. You've done something to tick off God. Where's the sin in your life? Don't, if you've got friends like that, just sort of run away. <laughs> okay? I mean, it, if you know if you've got sin in your life. There's no doubt. Have you ever been through trials and tribulations and the first thing you do is go, what did I do wrong? Don't ask that. I mean, if you do, let it be really brief, okay? Because if you're walking closer with the Holy Spirit, when you do something wrong, He tells you. How many of you know you're convicted right then? Now, if you keep doing it, that's just spiritual stupidity, okay? And just, you're going to get whatever and just repent and move on. <laughs> that's not a Bible phrase. I can't pers- point to a verse to that. <laughs> then at the other end, see, everything's got these pendulums, you know, these old pendulums on the old grandfather clock. 
Any of y'all ever remember those? Maybe you saw them in Grandma's house. The other pendulum is you get around friends and they start patting you. Oh, Dustin, I am so sorry you're going through all of that. You. you have it so hard. I don't see how you're enduring it. You, you just, you don't deserve this. Life isn't fair and you go on and on. Okay, you can do that one for about five seconds too. And then finally you go, Dustin, it's, life's not fair. That is true. And I am sorry you're going through this. Let's pray for wisdom is how to defeat this thing. If you're in it, he knows you can overcome it. 1 Corinthians 10.13 says, There is no temptation which is not common to man that I will not give you the strength to overcome. If you're in it, I've many times been in a test or triangle. I'm not going to make it. It's too big. That is not the truth. If it was too big for you or you wouldn't make it, he wouldn't lead you into it. That mean it's not hard. You know, you may be right in the middle of the trenches. They don't really do trenches, I guess, in warfare anymore. But you look at those old World War I movies, they're in those trenches. It's many times I feel like I'm in those trenches. And it may be hard, but he would, it would not be happening. You can count on that sovereignty of God that with his help and you leaning in and getting wisdom can't overcome it. But you've got to lean in, pause and get wisdom, and it will help you overcome it. And so don't get friends that say it's all your fault. Don't get friends that just let you stay there. Let them have pity on you. You know, they can take you out to eat dinner, give you a rose, do whatever you want to do. But eventually say, you're bigger than this thing because God's inside of you. Let's pray for wisdom. Let's count it all joy. And that's teaching us to be soldiers that take territory and you'll never regret it. I want you to stand and I'll pray over you. Good stuff. Do I pray for tests and trials? Never. If you want to, go for it. I think they're going to happen anyway. <laughs> yeah, it's like praying for patience. God knows in His sovereignty. See, the test and trials is to reveal what's in us. Because some of the testing and trials are in our brain. I remember years ago, one of my biggest tests and trials was, Craig, you talk too much, shut up, and you're too negative. He didn't say it quite like that, but it wasn't too far off. So I had to go through this training internally. Learn to shut up. Don't talk so much and don't be so negative. That was a test and trial in me so that he could position me to be more positive, profound, and personal when talking to other people instead of spreading junk all over them. Sometimes they're in you. Sometimes they're external. He'll bring these things, and when you get through, you go, yeah, I like this place a whole lot better. I like being positive better. I like being, you know, more more prophetic in my speaking. Amen? And he's doing it in you and around you. And, and all of a sudden one day they'll go, man, that Brandon dude, he is one mature guy. He really knows God. And they will come up to you and go, can you lay hands on me to be like you? And you go, I can lay hands on you to have tests and trials like I have, but no. You cannot impart maturity. I can pray that you have more tests and trials. No, 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 no. I don't want that. (laughs) Well, Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for all these soldiers in this room. I thank you that they are making a difference in this world. And thank you, Father, that you're going to help us this week. Any tests and trials, we don't ask for them. But if they come, thank you for all joy and all wisdom of how to walk through it. In Jesus' name, amen.